on in. I have a new neighbor that I want you to meet. His name is Roderick Townley, and he is indeed our neighbor out here. He's an author of juvenile, young adult, adult books, poetry, nonfiction, literary criticism. Roderick, you've done it all. Uh, <laughs> I didn't seem to know how, what I wanted to do when I grew up. <laughs> so then you, your focus was multifaceted. I yeah. think that's wonderful. Because you, you have been a poet and a fiction writer and uh, wrote for TV Guide, The Village Voice, and gosh, that's a lot. All that kinds is a of lot. Places. Yes. But in 2001, your, your life changed somewhat, and you mm. came home? Well, um, we moved to Kansas. I w had been living in New York right. and uh, working for various magazines uh -huh. as an uh, editor and writer. <laughs> but we moved here in 1990, so I've mm -hmm. been here over almost a quarter of a century now, so I consider myself in Kansas. Well, sort of. It, it's no. coming. It's how, coming. How long do I have to be I'm here? I'm not sure, but it's coming. It's coming. Maybe be rest uh, assured. In a few years. Huh? That's right. But you started the Sylvie Cycle, right. and you call it a metafictional series. What is metafictional? You know, I didn't know what that was until somebody called it that. Oh, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I think it means a, uh, a book about books. In other words, um, Sylvie the character who lives inside a book. Uh, the book is about her life within the book. So she's a character in a book, and when the book is closed, all the characters are free to live their own lives, and they you know, have their loves and their hates and their, their own lives, and then suddenly, after a long period, because it's not a popular book, um, somebody opens the book, and everyone has to rush to their places because um, they have to start saying their lines. It's uh, sort of like the Nutcracker come to the, when all the toys come to life. That's right, well, yeah. except they're already alive. Yeah, they're yeah, just yeah. Uh, busy doing other things. So I, I do have to say, I, I read the book. Uh, good, good. And it's called The Great Good Thing. And it is the first one in the cycle of In the three. trilogy, yeah. right. But I, and I, I have to say that I come from an age of reality. And this is fantasy. And I find it difficult to make that transition. I don't think it's fantasy. I think it's reality myself. Do you? Uh, sure. Um, don't we all, for instance, Sylvie goes into the dream of her reader. Don't we all dream about things that we've read? Um, maybe if we do read. Uh, well, some people don't read. But that's right. true. Yes, well, then they, they go into other that's right. l world. <laughs> Well, you know, Albert Einstein says reality is merely an illusion, there you go. although a very persistent one. It does seem to persist. Mm -hmm. It's there when we wake up in the morning, but um, no, I think that there is a certain outer reality and an inner reality. Mm -hmm. And um, we call the inner reality fantasy sometimes, or the unconscious, but um, and Sylvie, in the three books, explores the uh, inner landscape of the reader when, oh, something terrible happens to her book and she has to leave the book and go into the mind of the reader. So it goes much further than just a cute premise. Uh, it becomes, and especially since she stays the same age because she's a character. She's always 12 years old. Ah, but, but is it Claire? Claire is the first reader. Yes, yes, and, but Claire ages. Claire ages. And we're going to talk about that, because I think oh. that's really interesting. Yeah, the reader's age. Yeah, the reader's age. Maybe it's best to be a character in a book, because you're just kind of like... Sylvie doesn't you're understand. Like Dorian, you're like Dorian Gray, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, I, I, know that, I know that, and I need to tell all of you, that uh, Roderick Townley has been the recipient of so many prizes. I'm not going to list them all, but we are usually familiar with the Thorpe Mann Prize that's given every year, and you, you did... The, win that and the Kansas Arts Commission Fellowship you won in fiction. Uh, the Kansas Governor's Arts Award. These are all local ones which I thought would be yeah. more interesting to the um, and to You left out the Nobel Prize. Right? The Nobel Prize. That's, that's well. coming. That's <laughs> coming. <laughs> uh, what caused you to transition into uh, stories for young folks? Well I've always loved children's literature. Uh -huh. uh, I always I never felt that it was easy. I, I f only feel that perhaps I'm now old enough to write children's books. Um, I'm beginning to uh, get over the illusion of being a, a grown-up. 
Uh, I think we're all under that illusion, and I don't think any of us is really a grown-up underneath. Just scratch a grown-up and you'll find a kid. Um, usually a kid who has forgotten his childhood, and, or who wants to, but um, the childhood is... Or who doesn't want to leave it. Yes, well, that, in my case. Yeah. <laughs> Do you write through the eyes of your children or through your own eyes? Oh, well, through my own eyes as the nine-year-old I really am. I see. <laughs> I see. And, and, and as you mentioned before, which I think is kind of interesting, Sylvie is not a real person. She's a character in the book, and she sure. lives her life in that book. So now I think we need to set the stage for the great good thing. So the reader, we're talking about the reader, the characters, Sylvie's family, and the setting of the book. So let's, let's talk about, mm. s set the stage for us for, for this book. Well, um, the great good thing is a book which was, has only maybe one copy left in the world. It was perhaps pu privately published in 1917 or 18. And uh, so all, all of the people who originally read it have grown old and died. Uh, but the characters remain, as you, we mentioned, the same age as before. And uh, Sylvie doesn't understand why all these readers seem to be changing the way they look. Because she doesn't get the point of it. I mean, uh, and, and dying, she really doesn't understand because some of the bad guys in her book, they die, they get eaten by the owl and turned into insects by... Uh, they, they all undergo some sort of an apotheosis, right. one guy or another. <laughs> but then when you open yep. the book again, there they are again. So she doesn't understand why it doesn't work the same way with readers. <laughs> uh. Well, she also is striving to do one great good thing. Yes. Which I find kind of interesting because I think many of us strive to do at least one great good thing in yes. life and how to do that often eludes us. Right. Don't you think so? Mm-hmm, yeah. And she has to uh, ultimately save her, her story, uh, be, which is the book f has physically been destroyed. Well, that's right. Uh, and, and save everybody, but as one of the characters told her, Sylvie, you're the only character who can save this, save this world because you're the only character who can leave it. And she leaves it by entering the outer world that we live in, in the, in the dreams of one of the... Uh, readers. R one of the aging readers mm -hmm. who, who has forgotten the book. And it's true that um, a lot of the characters who live in the, now in the subconscious of the reader have grown rusty. They've gotten rust marks on them because uh, they're being forgotten. Well, they are, and she says, her, her father, the king, says to her, are you all right? And she says, well, I suppose so. And then she says, one of these days, we'll get a real reader, because the book has really been forgotten. That's her father says, well, it's all right, you know, like all parents try to console. And, she's, and she gives him kind of a doubtful look. And, um, well, we have to say everything she says in the book and I, I maybe they found some, well she says maybe they found something different to do than read our silly story and Sylvie says well the sun shines and readers read yeah she, she's under the illusion that all readers do is read that's all they do in their lives and then of course she finds out they live these complicated out, outside lives that she enters by entering their dreams and finding that actually they dream about a lot of other things in their book. Well, they do, and I, I found a wonderful quote. It says, the best thing about dreams is that fleeting moment when you are between asleep and awake, when you don't know the difference between reality and fantasy, when just for that one moment you feel with your entire soul that the dream is reality and that it really happened. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that kind of applies to the, yeah. if, you, if you really try to understand what Roderick Townley is trying to say, I think that, that kind of, because yeah. there is a, you know, that we blur that line sometimes. Right, and I think dreams are real, but they're on their own level. Uh, I think that really magic is just below the surface 
uh, of the pedestrian that we live in. And we, I'm always surprised that people don't see that underneath the sidewalks there's really an earth. Uh, that really underneath the appearances there's really a substratum of magic because I think it's there. I, I think though, remember Ferdinand the Bull? Yes. You have to take time to smell the flowers. That's, that's right. Well, that's true. So, and I think people don't do that. But sometimes in this book it reminds me a little bit of Alice in Wonderland. Hmm. And this is Thank the... Thank uh, Well, it does. And they want Sylvie to get married. And they okay. want him to, want her to marry true. Prince Rigoloff. This is in the story, mind you now. And she raced out onto the page, not marry Rigoloff. King Walther beamed, relieved to see her back in place, and he caught himself and harumphed. For heaven's sake, child, he's handsome and rich. And then she had to lean against the wall to catch her breath. And her hand rested on a suit, kind, rested on a suit of armor. And she says, kind, brave, yes. And the armor started to scrape along the wall. And one of the ladies in waiting fainted dead away. And somewhere somebody started to giggle. And King cast a worried glance at a large woman lying on the floor. The giggling grew, grew louder. I mean, everything is kind of uh, moving around like the yeah, Red King, Queen and the Black Queen. It is a little queen. bit mad. Uh huh. But the Red Queen and the Black Queen, remember? And, yeah. And I, and I thought, gosh, you know, it, it does. I, I think. Um, and then we talk about um, the reader that pops up, that's beginning to pop up occasionally. And. Um, S Sylvie has noted that before she marries the prince, she wants to do one great good thing. And the queen says, but you're only 12 years old. But then the reader starts to pop up. And talk about the reader. As you, how do you bring that in so that it makes sense? <laughs> I mean, that, you have to think about this stuff when you write oh, your book. Yeah, well, it's, it went through about 12 or 15 you know, versions. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Before I, uh, it started by the way with a, um, a bedtime story for my wife, uh, uh -huh. because um, she sometimes asked me to tell her a story, and, uh -huh. and the next day she said, "Well, oh, that sounded interesting. I went to sleep after two minutes, but could you write it down?" And ultimately, I wrote it down, and then I had to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it until it became the great good thing. Uh, but yeah, the um, the relationship between a character and the reader. It's always been central to my life because I've. We're all characters in our own story, and we're all readers of other people's stories. So I, I think we we play both roles all I the time. Do. Well, you bring in these two people, Charlie, who spills strawberry jam all over the book. Right. Well, he's not a good reader. No. He doesn't. He doesn't uh, respect a book. Yeah. Well, and Sylvie pokes her head from a thicket of a description, it says here, which yeah. I thought was kind of fun. And well, as Charlie says, well, why don't you read something real, he says to Claire. Exactly. Says, why don't you read something real, like volcanoes? Don't you know anything about volcanoes? Well, she says, I know lots of things. And he says, well, like what? And she says, well, I know how to read a book without slopping food all over it. Right, exactly. Reality versus. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, um, well, so, so she says well, to Charlie, what's so real about treasure maps? Well, there really is a treasure. Is there really? Mm -hmm. So, well, you know. People who live in the outer world think that, uh, have their own fantasies that they think are real. And, uh, we can make them real if we really believe. Yes, mm -hmm. Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, people do, uh, yeah. and there is a danger in that. It can be good, but it oh, yeah. can be dangerous. You know, all, I'm thinking about the seven children's, out of, out of the 15 books I've published, God help me, uh, seven of them are children's novels. And uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. I realize they're all quest books. They're all, uh, they're all the, the main character starts in a home base and has to leave home, as she does, when her book is burned and has to go on a quest to save the book, to save the story, and come back. And that's true of all the other books as well, if we, if, when we talk to some about some of those. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's very, uh, I hadn't quite put it together that way. But, um, and then I realized that the quest is really a mythical or archetypal thing that we all, we're all on a quest to we try the, to find the meaning in our lives and to, to accomplish a great good thing and then come back 
to slay the dragon out there and then come back uh, But I think we need to all realize that the great good thing is different for everybody. Yeah. Oh, and it yeah. is. And I, I just think, um, she says, and, and I, I love this, and it, it kind of comes in here, and she says, well, where would we be if we all started playing parts that weren't written for us? Right. And that's just kind of what we're talking about, because we yeah. each have to find our own great good thing. Yeah. It's funny, it's, it's a ch children's book, but I've been getting letters from grown-ups saying, you know, they talked to me because, I mean, one woman wrote to me and said it helped her deal with the death of her own mother. Because it seemed to be a crossover book in that way because it deals with death. Mm -hmm. The readers die, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Sylvie does, and, and uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, deeper uh, concerns. And one of the reviewers, most of the reviewers really loved this book, but I remember one said, you know, children won't like this. It's too complex. There's too many levels. They won't. But, you know, they take it on whatever level they take it on, uh, maybe an adventure story. But I've been getting letters from kids. For the, this came out in 2001, for the last decade, saying uh, how important it was to, in their own lives, um, to help them with deaths of their grandparents, for instance, and things like that. Well, don't you think that in looking for that great good thing, part of that is growing up? Sure. And I think Sylvie wanted to leave the kingdom. Yeah. She and she wanted to look at the reader. Both of those things were yeah. not It's allowed. against the law to look, at the, look up at the reader. That's right. That's right. And it's against the law to leave the kingdom. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yes. And, but as she did that, she says, uh, the, you say in the book, right before her, this is Sylvie, lay a world strangely different from the orderly land that she lived in. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a universal truth at yeah. some point in our lives, don't you think so? Uh, yeah. yeah, I do. <laughs> and she stopped. Now, they were probably, she was wondering where she was as she stepped across. Still, when had any character had the chance to explore a reader's dream? See, she's, she's entering that reader's dream. It was irresistible. Mm -hmm leaving the kingdom. Because she she's a very brave person anyway. She is, but it takes bravery to yeah. find that great good None thing. None of the other characters would have even noticed that there was another land that they could enter. That's right. But that's what makes some people very successful at mm -hmm. traveling that road of life, because there is always yeah. another land out there. Right. And she took a deep breath and she said, here goes. Yeah. And she s whispered and stepped across. That's Sylvie. That's Sylvie. Charge forth. Onward and upward, Excelsior. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, see, and I think um, one of the reasons um, that people read that, because you can read a number of things into exactly. this book. You've left a lot of, uh, it's like Swiss cheese. There are a lot of holes that one can peek mm -hmm. through uh, in this book. Mm -hmm. And she did, Sylvie did look at the reader. Right. And she said, you're the new reader. And the, the, Claire is the new reader. She said, oh, help me, they've taken my grandma. The thieves have taken my grandma. She's having a dream. This is a dream. Yes, and has. Sylvie has entered this dream. Yeah. The thieves, you know the thieves. Rigoloff's thieves, because her world is that book. Mm -hmm. So Sylvie relates it back to the thieves. The girl reached out, she grabbed Sylvie's hand and she, to pull herself along through the mud of her dream, of course, and distance shouts and crashes filled the air. We're all a part of Claire's dream with mm -hmm. Sylvie. And Sylvie says, I don't know what to do. This is not my story. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Well, Sylvie obviously comes from a very ordered fantasy world that's all written down. And here she steps over, off into this chaos of, uh, of, of an actual person's actual nightmare and uh, but she's able to navigate it ultimately because she is Sylvie after all and she actually helps the girl um, through through the girl's life as the girl grows to be a teenager and then is thinking about boys rather than the characters in the book right. and then thinking about bills 
that she has to pay uh, when she becomes an adult and then thinking about her own granddaughter when she becomes an old lady. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And in this dream, uh, Selvi, um, they're working their way through the dream. And Selvi says to the girl, you mean you don't know how your own story turns out? Right. Well, Sylvie knows. Of course. Because it's part of a book. It always ends the same way. It always ends the same way. And the girl shook her head and she said, well, all I knew was that you'd saved me. So he said, I'm not even supposed to be here. What are you talking about? Yeah. Hey, it sounds like a good book. I think so, too. <laughs> and and the gr Claire says to her, well, you do great good things. I've never even done little good things. All right. So Sylvie realized she'd only seen Claire from below. Right. Now that's an interesting analogy because in the book, the the characters in the book they look up and they look up, so they see their chin and their that they yeah. don't see. And but she thought all uh, Sylvie thought all readers had big chins and fat noses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see? But yeah, we're getting you into fantasy now. Yeah. See. All right. So um, I I just think. Some of the things that you point out, and sometimes we don't look at people. Right. We only look at the big chins and the fat noses, and we make um, mm -hmm. uh, we make suppositions that may or may not be true. So very true. You've involved the reader in the plot. Right. Why? Do, wh how did you do this? Was this a tool to get interest, or was it? How did well, you I didn't know how it was going to turn out until I was three quarters of the way through it. And then I said, I better know how it ends. So um, <laughs> all this happened because of what happened before. Um, in other words, I didn't mean for the book to catch on fire, uh -huh. but um, <laughs> it was happening. And, and my wife, who was my best editor and still is, she's a wonderful writer herself, said, don't, don't make that happen. And I realized it had to happen. If it doesn't die, it can't be born. Uh, if, uh, if the book doesn't burn, the characters can't save it. Uh, so I, I didn't plan things out the way I really should have, the way a lot of writers do. Did you plan differently in the other two books in the trilogy? Did you do it differently? No, I, I got a, a premise going. Uh, but then I just sort of let the characters tell me what was going to happen <laughs> as they went through it themselves which is really a dangerous thing because you don't want to get three quarters of the way through a book and then realize there's no ending here and then have to abandon it. But I was fortunate that it did, all three of them seemed to click shut. It seems to coalesce at some point. They clicked shut, yeah, like a nice box that I didn't know I was building. <laughs> right. The rule of the kingdom is never look at the reader. Of course not. Why not? Well, because then you're not acting your part. You're, you're getting out of character. You're, you're doing things that are not written for you. Sure. Well, I just think, um, let's talk just a little bit about that fish that keeps appearing in the, ah, in the book. Well, there is an invisible fish. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, yes, well, I don't know what to say about it. Um, Was there some reason that? A lot of kids wrote to me and said, could you send me a picture of the invisible fish? <laughs> and I had to write back and say, do you want a blank piece of paper? <laughs> it's an invisible fish, what can I say? Um, I had no... Is he just a decoration, so mm, there is no particular... Well, we need the invisible fish when the book catches on fire and they need to cross over this, the mirror of remind, as the water is called, to the, to the subconscious of the sleeping reader. Well, see, so you I have to have a transportation device. I, I think that um, the mirror of the, the mirror of remind is is a is a very interesting um, element to this book because as we pass through we're we constantly as Clara gets older she's reminded as she um, helps Lily see her mother Claire because we, we meet Claire's child Claire gets older and grows mm -hmm. up and. Um, Sylvie helps Lily to see her mother. Uh, so the mirror of remind goes all the way through, to me, goes mm -hmm. all the way through that book. So I have to say, is life a dream? Well, what do you think? Oh, I do. <laughs> okay. So, so you are a fantasy reader. So, so, so the idea is that it can be whatever you want it to be. Mm. Yes? No? I don't know. It, uh, there is an, 
there is a reality uh, that we don't necessarily make up, but it's not always the outer reality. I think it's interesting. Yeah. I do. Thank you. But I think um, The Door in the Forest is your most recent Yeah, book. that just came out last and year. And sooner or later, we all must step through that door in the forest. Right. Again, it's another going forth from the comfortable to the unknown and back again. Uh, there's, um, there's an island that it's in, in a farmland, but there's an island that no one has ever gotten to. Mm -hmm. And uh, but Daniel, the, who's the young young boy there, w always wants to get to this island, but it's protected. It's protected by uh, a stream that no one can cross. So um, again, it, they go there and uh, are changed, and then return changed to a changed land, and are able to save their own land because of because of the quest that they've been on. And it, it's the change is always a constant. Yeah. It is. It's a nice little um, mm -hmm it is. thing to say. Uh, I, how do, how, is it hard to dream up these characters? Well, it takes me about a year to get into uh, all these characters, and then I, a year to write it, perhaps, and then a year to forget the characters enough that so I can create can, yeah. new characters. Well, the, the middle of the trilogy is the blue shoe, so I want to be sure that everybody understands that the great good thing, the blue shoe, and the door in the forest. Well, yes. Uh, actually, the trilogy is the first three silly books. These are standalone but novels. But these are the newest ones. Most yes, recent yes. ones, yes. You know, I, um, I found a quote uh, from Dr. Seuss, and I, and I think that it, it's good for the book. He says, uh, the first part, the, the part that I took was, it's a way uh, of looking at life through the wrong end of a telescope because you, hmm. you see a, you know, a telescope gives you a, but if you look through the wrong end, you see just a little bit. Yeah. And well, I think it's a, it's a focus on uh, life uh, that you mm. have, and the, the change and the passage and the, the dreams. And if, uh, you know, if you're lucky, then um, um, it's, it, it works. And I think your books yeah. have worked, and I yeah. think they'll yeah. work for young people. Uh, as well as older ones. And there's a certain amount of really good luck involved. For instance, I'm now with a, a fine publisher called Knopf, and with well, the Knopf Blue Shoe. Knopf is an excellent publisher. With yeah. the Blue Shoe, for instance, my editor loved it so much, she printed the, you have the first edition where, which is printed in blue ink. <laughs> and it has. Uh, I think that's wonderful. And it has um, all these internal uh, drawings and pictures by this by the Harry Potter I mean, illustrator. That's, that's wonderful, and I, you uh, know, Knopf is a wonderful publisher. Barnes and Noble carries the book, and Maya Angelou will close out as I say thank you, and she says, if one is lucky, a solitary fantasy can totally transform one million realities. Oh, I, I like that one. I do too. Well, thank Roderick you. Townley, thank you so much. Oh, it's been And fun. thank you for being with us. It is our community, and I'll see you back here again soon, and we'll talk to another one of our neighbors. Bye.